going live in 5 4 3 2 1 we are now live good evening everyone we welcome you all to ortho tv online in association with orthopedic research and education foundation to introduce today's topic and speaker i hand over to the secretary of oref dr janki badani thank you neeraj sir uh, so good evening everyone uh, welcome to the platform of orthopedic research and education foundation india today we have our chairman dr john mukhopadhyay sir who is taking a class on atypical femoral fracture which is a very controversial and confusing topic so over to you sir thanks uh, janki and good evening everybody uh, today we are going to discuss atypical femoral fractures i think this is a term which uh, we hardly heard about 15 years ago but are going to in, uh, hear about it increasingly so as the day, days go on and this is generally related to excessive use of bisphosphonates okay so these are also known as bisphosphonate induced fractures uh, we are going to look at why this happens how we detect it what are its features and how do we treat it okay now atypical femoral fractures are a form of fragility fractures and occur in patients who have been treated with bisphosphonates and it's related to reduced bone to turnover. The fact that uh, the osteoclasts get uh, sort of uh, turned down by the mechanism of uh, by which bisphosphonates act where they inhibit the osteoclasts uh, leads to a reduced bone turnover and therefore at some stage the bone becomes brittle and then tends to break. The exact mechanism is not known and was first reported by Orbina et al. in 2005. So um, what I'm going to do today is to talk about bisphosphonate or related uh, fractures or atypical femoral fractures and then at the end of it, end of the talk, I'm going to go run through some cases which are not uh, typically bisphosphonate fractures but uh, forms of uh, fractures which may or may not be very similar to what happens with uh, the use of bisphosphonates and then we're going to run through some cases and how we manage them and that is actually if I, I just realized that apart from postgraduates and DNB students some senior surgeons also seem to be watching this program and so that part would be of interest to them as well okay uh, now what do bisphosphonates do? Actually, bisphosphonates are carbon substitute analogs of pyrophosphates and they bind to hydroxyapatite and are absorbed by bone. Okay, and once they absorb by bone, they inhibit bone resorption by reducing the hydroxyapatite dissolution. Also, it's thought there's no uh, definite certainty about this, but uh, it is cyto it does cause cytotoxic or metabolic injury to mature osteoclasts and inhibits the attachment of osteoclasts to bone. Uh, therefore, they also uh, reduce the osteoclast activity, also inhibit osteoclast differentiation and recruitment, uh, and they interfere with the osteoclast cytoskeleton. So it affects the uh, osteoclasts in various ways. Some of it is uh, what uh, has been uh, sort of inferred from science and not absolutely proved, but these are the various mechanisms of, of uh, action that have been postulated. And now we are also seeing it with the use of denosumab, which is also being used for osteoporosis. And uh, so initially it was thought that denosumab does not cause these problems. Now with the increasing use of denosumab, we are apparently also seeing uh, these type of fractures with the use of denosumab. Okay, now if you examine the, look at the histological examination of the tissue at fracture site, uh, the uh, there is crack healing attempted but not successful. So there is attempt at fracture healing or crack healing, but it is not successful. There is amorphous material without cells at fracture site. Okay, and Although they are living cells in adjacent tissue, 
the fracture area has amorphous material with very little cells in them and therefore healing gets delayed. Okay, now the other thing is that this starts as an incomplete fracture and may be missed. So patient will comp complain of pain in the region of the hip and you'll see the x-rays and you can't really see anything or you see some mild uh, crack type thing which you're not sure and you ignore it or you miss it altogether. And uh, these may be what may be the prodromal symptoms of something that is going to happen, as you can see in this case, and will often end up with a fracture if you haven't taken precautions in due time. Okay, so that's what happens. So this is what is talked about as the dreaded black line. Okay, so if you look at the x-rays, uh, you can't really make out clearly, but as you magnify the x-ray here, you can see this dreaded black line, which is the earliest sign of something going to happen. And you can also see the bone here, the cortex hypertrophing on that side. Now, here's an example of a lady. Now, she was treated elsewhere for many of her fractures. She had bilateral knee replacements, again, uh, done elsewhere. She had a periprosthetic fracture on the right side and, uh, and she had been on bisphosphonates for many, year, many years and she had this typical bisphosphonate fracture on the left side, which is treated with a nail. And if you look at the nailing, you, in a normal patient, this would have healed probably, okay? But you see over a period of time, uh, when she came, comes to us uh, later, this fracture has not healed. This is what she comes to us with, okay? And uh, what we didn't notice at that time was if you looked at the opposite side and then look very closely at this, you can see that there is a small black line on that side. Actually, this is in the initial x-ray when she had the surgery uh, in another city. Okay, You can see at this stage, uh, this is there. In retrospect, we could find this. Uh, she came to us with, uh, at this stage, because this fracture was not healing. And we also x-rayed the other side and we also didn't actually notice or didn't uh, think it was anything very significant until she came back with this fracture on uh, that side as well, okay? So, and in retrospect, we could see this little black line which we missed and we could have prevented this fracture from taking place. However, we fixed this with a long nail. You can see uh, the, the at present, it looks okay, but we don't really have the follow-ups on her to be able to say what's happened to it, okay? Now, the ASBMR, which is the sort of Association for Metabolic Bone Diseases, have uh, described five major uh, factors which should be there, out of which at least four must be pres uh, present to label it as a atypical femoral fracture. Uh, so one is that the trauma should be low velocity, or a low energy trauma. Uh, it usually starts in the lateral cortex. The fractures are usually transverse or slightly oblique. Uh, uh, there may be just an incomplete fracture on the lateral cortex. There's minimal or no combination. So this, another thing that tells you that this is a low energy fracture is there's usually no combination. And there's beaking of the lateral cortex. So classical, this beaking, on the lateral cortex side, okay? So that is what you need to look out for when you're trying to uh, diagnose these fractures because some of these patients will come to you with a fracture without giving you the history of bisphosphonates intake. Sometimes we have had patients who do not actually know they've had bisphosphonates. Believe it or not, we recently had a patient where we tried very hard to find out whether she had had bisphosphonates or not. And she kept saying no, and then finally it turned out that she had had bisphosphonates for almost three years before she had come to us uh, with the fracture. Okay, now uh, there are also some minor criteria uh, which uh, can be sort of uh, uh, additional diagnostic criteria, which could be generalized increase in cortical bone thickness of the diaphysis and showed uh, unilateral or bilateral prodromal symptoms like high pain, bilateral incomplete, in, uh, incomplete or complete fractures and delayed fracture healing. Okay, now, so how do, do we treat it? 
I think if you diagnose it at the stage where a crack has appeared, then I think it behoves you to nail it before the bone fracture. So at the moment you see that there's a doubt that there's a fracture, plus she has prodromal symptoms, then you would go ahead and nail it. Now, if there's nothing on the x-rays, but she's having early prodromal symptoms, I think an MRI can give you some idea by showing you some evidence of uh, a, a beginning of a crack or a increased uptake in that region. Uh, and uh, so then you have to decide. So you have this option of either nailing it prophylactically or maybe switching, stopping the bisphosphonates, uh, changing to maybe teriparatide and then watching very closely. Because what you don't want is this patient to fracture and then uh, have a displaced subtrochantric fracture. And as we all know that these bisphosphonate fractures take a long time to heal. So here's a lady who we had we treated uh, uh, recently. You can see uh, she came with pain on the left side, although we see this kind of cystic lesion on the left, right-sided trochanter, but the pain was here. Again, if you look very carefully, you can see this dreaded black line here. And she was, uh, I think, uh, a doctor herself or related to a doctor. So she was, uh, when we discussed it, they said, no, please go ahead and nail it. We did that MRI just to and locate what it looked like on the MRI. And you can see this uh, kind of increased uh, 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 shadow is here and some edema, bone edema there. And uh, we went ahead and nailed it. And even when you nail these incomplete fractures, it takes a long time for the prodromal symptoms to disappear. And this is a, uh, almost six months post-op. You can see how this is uh, now gone on to heal and she has no symptoms now. So as I mentioned, even after prophylactic nail, it can take weeks before the symptoms subside and much longer for this crack to unite. Okay, So for it to completely disappear on the x-rays takes a long while. Okay, now what are the adjunctive treatment? I think you must stop bisphosphonates. I think that's one of the first things you should do if you're suspecting a bisphosphonate-related fractures. You must make sure they have calcium, their vitamin D levels need to be checked. And if it's low, you need to give them adequate vitamin D. And there is teriparatide. So from, because they are on bisphosphonates, usually because they are osteoporotic, you need to change them to teriparatide. We are still not sure whether this actually helps in the fracture healing, but it should help with osteoporosis. And teriparatide is known to promote, uh, sort of, uh, is supposed to, uh, uh, cause osteoblastic activity. So hopefully it will help in healing. Uh, but there's little clinical evidence to show or confirm that it actually helps in healing. Now there are various risk factors. Interestingly, uh, Asian ethnicity is one of them. If you have bored femora already there and you're there on bisphosphonates, you risk uh, have an increased risk of getting these fractures. Similarly, if you have a varus femoral neck shaft angle, uh, prodromal symptoms, okay? So if you have thigh or groin pain, uh, I think you need to investigate these patients very carefully. Uh, of course, if they had a long duration of anti-resorptive therapy. So usually more than three or four years is when you start getting uh, uh, these fractures to take place. So today, I think most people would recommend to have a holiday after. So bisphosphonate holiday of at least six to 12 months after three or four years of therapy. Uh, patients on glucocorticoid therapy on top of uh, this are again prone to this. And uh, one of the patients we treated had been on glucocorticoids and had been given bisphosphonates as well. And signs of early fracture line or periosteal reaction on imaging of the femur. So watch very carefully for the x-rays, especially if you have prodromal symptoms. And if you have any doubt, get an MRI at an early stage. Now, what are the difficulties in treating these fractures? I think one is the reduction of these fractures because these are short oblique fractures with this uh, beak on the thing. To get that accurately reduced can be quite uh, difficult. And most of this we try to do close so it can be difficult. Okay. And getting your entry point right. Now, because these are in virus, 
uh, getting the entry point exactly right can be difficult. And of course, getting a stable reduction post nailing. So because it tends to uh, kind of uh, deform because of the previous virus or uh, deformity at the uh, of the femur itself. And so you have to be very careful about how you nail it. And there are some controversies about what is the best way to treat these uh, to the extent that people think that these are fractures where you probably nail it if necessarily in a bit of valgus. So you try to correct the varus angle if there's any and also add a plate on the lateral side as a tension band to get good compression on the lateral cortex, good contact. And if you need to open reduce these to get good contact and good reduction, it is better. So these are the thoughts that are going around and uh, as to how to deal with these fractures when you have to deal with them. Okay. Now, of course, prevention is really the key. Uh, so like I said, consider drug-free holiday after three years. Treat only high-risk groups. That means either they have already got significant osteoporosis or the FRAC scores are high, which suggests that they might go on to have an osteoporotic fracture. So then you would treat them. And there are now different regimes with the uh, sort of uh, various drugs which are now be coming about like denosumab and even more of uh, some of the uh, other medicines which are now being used uh, which you and different regimes which are being tried uh, to prevent uh, this happening. So of these uh, bisphosphonate related fractures. The other problem is the healing. And if they go into non-union, treating these can be very difficult. Uh, this is a lady who presented to us. She had uh, three previous surgeries elsewhere. This was the first x-ray we have where she had a nailing done. Uh, that failed and then she had this plating which looks pretty okay with bone grafting and BNP. So this was what was done. So it's, uh, the whole works was given to her. Okay, but if you look at the X-rays really critically, you can see the on the lateral X-ray, we don't have full contact. Okay, and if you see this later one where she had a second bone grafting procedure, again, you can see that this anterior cortex here doesn't match with the anterior cortex of the femur, which suggests that the contact, the posterior cortex is here, and the contact area is not probably that great. And as you can see with time, uh, what, uh, it goes on for the, you can see now the plate has broken here, okay? You can see that the plate has broken here. So then she came to us, uh, This she was in a different city. Uh, it was now seven years or something since the uh, original treatment and we had to go ahead and treat it. So uh, our plan was because of all the numerous holes that were already there in this area and this part of the bone, you see, is there's not much left there. Even though the cortex was good, we thought we'd put a fibular graft through to here. But because of the previous nail thing, whenever we tried to pass the fibular graft, uh, it kind of went into virus. So we didn't want that. Okay, so what we did then was uh, we did a slight uh, excision of the bone here and we put the fibula in the proximal part because these were holes where we wanted the screws to pass through the fibula to give us good purchase. And then we used a locking plate, compressed it with a compression device. So we really compressed it, then fixed it. And then we added an additional plate anteriorly for giving it further stability. So this is what was the eventual fixation with bone grafting. Now you can see the contact is good. The virus is corrected. You can see how the plate is actually got, if you look at it, it's in slight malgus there. And uh, you can see the hole here where we use the compression device. Okay, so this is important when you're dealing with non-unions is to get absolute stability. And she went on to do quite well uh, for uh, nine months, she was fine. And then she started complaining of uh, severe pain in the region of the hip. And so this was worrying and uh, she uh, consulted many people. Uh, she got a CT scan. Again, I looked at the CT scan. I thought it looked okay, but uh, it got reported as uh, some uh, inadequate healing. 
Uh, they got so because of this line here. So this got reported as this is not healed, but looking at it, I felt it was healing. We got a bone scan. This also showed a slightly hot spot here. So that was worrying, but uh, just by the fact that all the screws were still uh, totally solid and there was no evidence of any lysis around any of the screws, I sort of managed to convince her to hold on. And you can see by 20 months, this fracture has gone on to heal. And this is at three years post-op. You can see how she is nicely healed. And now the pain, this pain was really from her spine rather than the leg. She finally got an MRI done, which showed she had pretty severe spinal stenosis, which was possibly the cause of the pain. Okay, so uh, I think uh, final take home on these bisphosphonate or atypical femoral fractures is that it's certainly going to increase in numbers. Uh, they're going to be difficult to treat. Uh, there's an increased risk of delayed healing. And the non-unions can be even more difficult to deal with. So I think it's important that you try and pick them up before the bone actually fractures and deal with it at that stage so that you prevent these problems from taking place. Okay, so um, now do you want me to continue with the cases or do you want to take some questions now and then carry on with the second part? So uh, we, uh, you please continue with the cases, then we can go ahead. So... This is one of the kind of uh, difficult issues you can get. This is a uh, patient with fibrous dysplasia with severe deformity. And here, when you're nailing it, you need to try and correct the deformity. In this case, we did multiple osteotomies. These were open osteotomies. Today, we can do some of these osteotomies by closed techniques. This was a long time ago, and that went on to heal. So this is another gentleman. Again, you can see the typical bone kind of uh, condition here, which and the fracture line, very suggestive of a bisphosphonate related fracture, but he did not give any history of bisphosphonates. Okay, so now he was in again holidaying in somewhere and uh, they decided to nail it. So that was what was done. Now, if you look at these x rays just on the AP, maybe you can say it's okay, but always. Remember that you must also have a lateral. And now if you see the lateral, you can see what has happened here. Okay, these locking screws are not in the nail. They've gone anteriorly through this fracture. Uh, the fracture is totally displaced here. And it's little surprise that it didn't go on to heal. So he had a second surgery where a longer nail was put in. Again, only an AP X-ray was done uh, until later when a lateral X-ray was done. And you can see that Again, the proximal fragment is still kind of um, in that position where it is flexed and abducted. And so uh, once again, the reduction is not adequate and it failed. So this is when he came to us in this situation. You can see by now it's displaced even further in terms of the varicization. Uh, and uh, so now we had to treat it. So, Again, here we decided that we need to compress it, get absolute stability and bone graft it. Uh, so uh, we went in, uh, this is a CT scan just to try and figure out exactly the position of the bones. Uh, I mean, we could have done it without the CT scan. And then we went ahead and did this locking plate. Uh, we compressed it, so you can see the screw here. So we compressed it with the compression device. Uh, we could have used a slightly longer plate. So if you're going to be really critical, I would have probably wanted to use a slightly longer plate. But we've uh, this gap here is not such a big problem if you've got good contact laterally, okay? So this, as you can see, took time. But he had no pain, so we held on. And you can see this has gone on to heal, but then he fractured the other side. And... Again, if you look at this fracture, it's very typical of what a bisphosphonate fracture or an atypical femoral fracture would look like. But as I said, not all of them give you a history of bisphosphonates. And we decided to plate this and you see how much we had to bend the plate. And still we had some lateral opening once we compressed it, okay? But uh, we felt this was a reasonably good position. 
We are following him up. He's okay, but we still haven't got the uh, X-ray showing full healing. Again, because of the pandemic, he was unable to visit us and show us the situation. Okay. <coughs> the other situation is osteopetrosis and pycnodisostosis, which are relatively similar. Now, this is a gentleman who had plating for this once before and then went and fractured just above it. So these can be problems. Okay, so you have to, uh, first taking these screws out can be difficult. So you need to have all your sets available with you. Luckily they came out and then what we did here was again plating with compression, okay? We used the LCP, which we molded. And one of the advantages of an LCP in a situation like this is that we can use uh, unicortical locking screws, okay? Uh, because uh, this, the bone lateral cortex is so thick that you don't always have to use bicortical screws. So you can see we just use unicortical screws. We compressed it, so all unicortical screws, so that when it comes to taking these out, it will be a bit easier. It's bad enough with uh, locking screws in normal bone. So when you have this kind of osteopetrosis, it's going to be really difficult to take these implants out if you have to, or they fracture around the implant. Luckily, this went on to heal well. And he did okay, I was, uh, had a good clinical result as well. Uh, here's another case with osteopetrosis, again, very severe osteopetrosis. Uh, she had this fracture and came to us about uh, a few weeks after the fracture. Interestingly, she had a neck fracture on the opposite side, which she'd had as a child. And you can see this is not united and this is uh, ridden up altogether here. And, uh, but that was not bothering her so much, but this, after this fracture, she couldn't walk. So we had to treat it. So we went with the same plan. We uh, decided that we're going to compress it, bone graft it with a plate. Uh, again, you have to be careful, have good drill bits and enough drill bits because you might break some of them. Uh, we compressed it. Uh, again, you can see some unicortical locking screws uh, now you can see the follow-up over a period of time. That was at two months. This is at seven months. This is at 10 months, 15 months. The fracture line is still there. But again, because the, she had no pain and the screws was still holding, we waited. This is 24 months. This is six years post-op. Uh, healing, but still not. The fracture line is still there. And this is something you might see with this kind of bone is that because the surrounding bone is so dense, the fracture line area appears to be still there for a long time. And this is at seven years. Now you can see it's healed, but now she came with this subtrochanteric fracture on the other side. So this is a difficult situation again. And so we decided here that we would fix it, but we'd also do a valgus osteotomy to try and change the angle of the uh, neck fracture to see if we could get it to heal, okay? So that's what we did. It's not 100% uh, uh, valgus size, but you can see how we've lateralized the distal fragment a bit and valgusized it considerably. You can see how the trochanter has come down quite a lot from what it was. And this is the follow-up. This is at about uh, two months. This is at four months. And finally, you can see that by, this is, uh, sorry, at five and a half months. And this is at six, uh, sorry, this is at three months and this is at six months. You can see now, the osteotomy has gone on to heal and the fracture also seems stable. Heal just because we've changed the angle of the fracture line from a vertical to a more horizontal line, this fracture has gone on to heal. Uh, so one last case, and this is another interesting patient who we saw, I saw in the OPD complaining of pain in the region of the left trochanteric side and hip region. And he was walking, but with a limp and this had been going on for quite a few years, quite a few months, and he had seen a couple of doctors and they kind of didn't think it was anything 
very serious. So we got an X-ray, and to our surprise, we saw this. Okay, so you see the left side femur is totally mottled with all these uh, sort of areas of lysis. Uh, the bones are osteoporotic. You see the other side also it's osteoporotic. So having seen a few of these cases, it immediately um, sprung to my mind that we need to investigate him for parathyroid problems. So we got his blood tests and you can see he had all the classical uh, features of hyperparathyroidism. Uh, you need to investigate it further in terms of, uh, so here you can see the skull x-rays got that typical uh, uh, kind of uh, sign on the skull x-ray of this um, uh, mottling on the outer surface. The bone scan showing multiple uh, so, uh, lesions all over the bo body. You can see again the skull, uh, periphery of the skull, the same kind of signs that you see. And the parathyroid scan, which shows you a localized adenoma here and increased uptake in all the parathyroids. And this was the gland which was removed by the general surgeons. You can see it's quite a large parathyroid adenoma. That was the thing. And once this was removed, what happens is you have to then monitor their calcium very carefully, okay? Because the calcium tends to drop suddenly and you may need to give them intravenous calcium, etc. Uh, now, so the surgeons had, them, had him under them and then uh, once they had taken that out and got all that controlled, then they sent him back. But by that time, this is what the x-ray looked like, okay? So now this was a real challenge, how we would fix it. Uh, we were worried about trying to nail it because we weren't sure whether we'd be able to get the nail in the right direction and whether it will uh, do well in this situation. Uh, we decided to plate it. We used a distal femur locking plate, but multiple screws in the proximal part and used the longest plate available so that we had a good spread of the plate which went beyond the lytic lesion and you can see over a period of time how this fracture has gone on to heal and gradually all his other uh, metabolic problems and uh, everything settled down. And we, you can see now what the bone is looking so much better. This is at about one and a half years post-op, uh, about two years post-op. You can see it's almost looking like normal bone now and he's got a good function. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, and take questions. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, there are a few questions in the chat box. Uh, the first one asked by Kumar Gautam is that why subprochantric area is more common? So if you look at the loads which go through the femur, that is one of the areas that is most loaded, okay? And because these patients usually have a Boeing in that area, uh, that is where the lateral cortex tends to give first. Okay, so it's not that it can't happen anywhere else, but the spontaneous fractures tend to happen in the subtrochantric region because that is the area which I think is loaded the most. Uh, there's no other very good answer. The combination of the Boeing and the loading in that part, uh, if you look at uh, the forces going through the that part of the uh, uh, proximal femur, they are huge. So, uh, another thing he has asked is, instead of long PFN, can we use interlocking nail for preventing fixation? Sorry? So, long he's asking... Is an interlocking nail, no? Yeah, yes, sir. So, instead of... Long, long PFN means, he may be asking that uh, when we are using, that is screw to the head also in that one. Maybe he's asking if we cannot use that. That is okay for... No, a, a, a standard nail. Yes, sir. You can, but again, uh, the important thing is that if you're dealing with these fractures, you don't want them to subsequently fracture through the neck either. Huh? So it's good to use something that is going to prevent that from happening. In terms of the reduction, that is important whichever way you do, okay? So it's important that you, if you fix these in varus, they almost always have problems. Okay, so it's important that you correct the 
varus angulation when you do your nailing and get good contact. And like I said, in spite of that, there may be delayed healing. So people are going to the extent of saying that you, these are situations where you may do nail plus a compression plating for the lateral side to give it further stability. Mm -hmm. And make sure your reduction is very good. So if you're not getting a perfect closed reduction, be prepared to do an open reduction. And scoop out. So this is the other issue. The bone cells at the fracture site are usually very uh, poor. Okay, so if you are opening it, it's suggested that you curate out all that area so that you get down to bleeding uh, sort of Live bone when you do your fixation. So, uh, Sachin has asked uh, about the common area of a typical fracture other than the <coughs> Sorry? Common area of a typical fracture other than subprochantric fracture. In a so, typical, typical fractures of this are there. Okay, now you can get similar type of uh, fractures wherever you get stress fractures. Okay, you can get it in proximal tibia. You can get it in, uh, it's still, again, it's also related to bowing, etc. So if you have a varus deformity, then you get these proximal tibial fractures quite often. So it's usually in the lower limb and usually in these areas where the stress is concentrated. Often with some biomechanical uh, uh, problem with the loading. And so uh, what about osteoporosis treatment, sir, because uh, this is these fractures are usually common in osteoporosis and after that bisphosphonate, uh, we can't give bisphosphonate further. So, so that's what I'm saying now. So the treatment would normally be to change to some other treatment. Okay. So you, what, do you, what do you have? You have teriparate, you have denisumab. Gradually, you'll have some other new drugs coming up. You can use... Uh, other agents like, uh, of course, calcium and vitamin D are always supplemental when you're doing this, okay? So there's some other newer drugs which you can always look up and read up of yourself. So some other anabolic, uh, like, okay, sir. No, no, there are other biologicals which are coming up now. Yeah, apart from Denisumab, there's some newer biologicals. And so, uh, if we have to give treatment uh, for osteoporosis for long, so uh, that is, as you mentioned, it is recommended so for four to five years for this yeah, so give, No, maybe three years, give a holiday for a year, then start again. Okay. The problem is with uh, teriparatide, you have a period of about two years that you can give it. And then they say you can't give it. So, you don't want to use that unless the osteoporosis is very low, that means uh, density is very low when you have a score of 4.5 or something like that, or you've had already given bisphosphonates and they have a bisphosphonate fracture, or in the more elderly group, because then if you give that, what do you do next? Okay. So sir, it is lifetime uh, that drug doses what you have mentioned is for two years for teriparatide and three to five years for bisphosphonate, right? No, bisphosphonates you stop and then start again. Okay, sir. Not that you can't so, again. Okay, the second other thing is what is also important for osteoporosis is not to forget is walking, that means weight loading exercises. Okay, muscle strengthening. Okay. Uh, Calcium, vitamin D, all these. So it's not one thing. It's all these things which you need to be given together. Okay. And so uh, for uh, this teriparatide, uh, do we need a drug holiday in between? If it is uh, for two years, then uh, we can no, no, continue. Teriparatide, I don't, I mean, in the sense that it's not yet very clear. Normally they say that you should not give it again, but I have more people who've had it a second time. But usually what you do is once you give it for two years, you don't use it again as far as at present, but things may change. So now you have other alternatives which you'll have to change to like then SMAB and you can give some of the anabolic steroids for some time, etc. But I think uh, 
the evidence is lacking. Uh, for bone pain, you can give uh, things like calcitonin, but it doesn't help long term for osteoporosis. Uh, some of the other drugs like vitamin K2, etc., have been tried boron, etc. But um, in women, you can give SERMs, that is the uh, estrogen mod uh, modulators, okay, selective estrogen modulators, like uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, it's, it's no longer available, so tamoxifen and things like that. So, Unfortunately, that's no longer available in India. I don't know exactly why, but it's difficult to get in India. But for the perimenopausal patients, that was quite a good drug. Okay, there are other some flavonoids, etc., which there's little evidence about how good they are. But the standard drugs are these three. So, uh, in the literature, it is mentioned uh, about that bisphosphonate induced atypical fracture, we can give a teriparatide. Is there any risk of a fracture with teriparatide also, sir? Oh. No, so there's a risk with, of fracture with osteoporosis. Okay, but teriparatide doesn't cause atypical fractures. Okay, so you can, if you injure yourself, you fall, your bones, osteoporosis doesn't become normal just because you use teriparatide. Huh? Okay, so uh, teriparatide uh, does help in terms of improving the bone density. That's one of the two drugs which actually improves your bone density. That's bisphosphonate, it's a teriparatide. And now denisumab is being shown to also possibly improve your bone density. And so, uh, I'm just want to uh, know that is there any uh, condition in which a bisphosphonate should not be given for osteoporotic treatment like when we are starting with because that is most commonly yeah so there may be some situations where people do not tolerate if they have severe ulcers etc because uh, what is what happens with oral bisphosphonates what is the yeah, biggest that, yeah that gastric irritation it because uh, if no it is it's the, the thing you need to be sure with oral bisphosphonates is what that they don't lie down for 45 minutes. Half an hour. Yeah. Because you don't want it. It's not just gastric, it's esophageal. Okay, they can irritate the esophagus. They even cause rupture of the esophagus. Okay, erosions of the esophagus. Two ruptures. So that's important. Okay. So that one then, I think in renal patients, you have to be a bit careful about the dosage. So obviously, you need to check that. In severe liver problems, you have to be careful. So all those standard uh, things with most drugs that you need to watch out for, but no specific this thing except this problem. Yeah? So uh, in the cases you have shown some of the subprochantric fracture treated with long PFN and a few of them is uh, not like uh, it is middle size PFN. So how to decide the length uh, in those fractures? Sir? So I think when you're dealing with a non-union, you're looking for absolute stability, okay? So you don't have to go really long, okay? So if you're dealing with a fresh fracture where you're looking for bridging, then you go long. Okay, when you're looking for a non-union where you're doing compression, then you give it long enough that you get adequate screws you need. So I would I'd still not use very short plates. Like earlier, it was just four holes on each side. I would use at least six to eight holes on the one side of the fracture and maybe not fill in all the holes. Okay, But when you're doing compression, that really long, uh, the, it's not the same as bridging fixation. So you have to, the length of the plate doesn't need to be as long. And so uh, when you are uh, treating a non-union following a bisphosphonate, fracture or failed fracture, then uh, what consideration we usually take? You have mentioned something like a Muller's div that compression device and also other. Yeah, so you have to three things. One is good contact. Yes. Correct the any varus valgus alignment. Okay. Uh, freshen the bone ends. You really need to freshen the bone ends before you compress. Okay, make sure that you've got live bone and, and because usually the fracture site has dead cells in it. So you need to make sure that live bone is there and then bone grafted. 
Okay, now people use other things like bisphol, uh, like BMP, etc. If you read the Western literature, they will, but we've not had to use that. We've not used it because it's not easily available to us and it's very expensive. And there's some issues about the use of BMP worldwide at the moment. So we don't use it, although there are centers which still use it. Okay. And so in those cases, uh, do uh, we use, uh, we can use that uh, nail also, that PFP? Yeah, so that's, so that's what I'm saying. This is the, the thing you have to decide is between a combined nail and plate and just for non-unions, because just using a nail in a non-union, uh, it, it will not give you absolute stability. Okay, but for fresh fractures, yes, but you have to make sure you get your, make sure it's not in virus, make sure there's good contact and it's well reduced. If it's not well reduced, it's not going to yield. So, uh, I have noticed in the literature... So a lot of fractures which would heal in normal bone will not heal in the bisphosphonate fracture. So, uh, in the literature, it is uh, usually given with the oral bisphosphonate. Uh, when we are using a jolindronic acid uh, as a anti-resorptive therapy, do we have risk of that? Because very uh, poor literature I have got. In the, I'm not sure about that. So, you said what you said. Yeah. The literature doesn't have too much evidence of that, but... Uh, if you're going to give it for seven years, then you're... So the most of the bisphosphonate fractures first started getting reported after about six, seven years of alendronate treatment. So, uh, so I think uh, most of the thing we have covered, sir. And, sure. Uh, yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. It's okay. really still thank have, you. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure.